sir, those are my words. Stephen Duncan, our first speaker today, will speak under the heading Imagining Lo No Place, the Subversive Mechanics of Utopia. Stephen Duncan is an associate professor at the Gallatin School of New York University, where he teaches the history and politics of media. He's the author of Dream, Reimagining Progressive Politics in an Age of Fantasy and Notes from the Underground, Signs and the Politics of Underground Culture. He's also the co-author of The Bobbed Hair Bandit Crime and Celebrity in 1920s New York and the editor of The Cultural Resistance Reader. He writes on the intersection of culture and politics for a range of publications from The Nation to Playboy. Duncombe is a lifelong political activist, among other things, working as an organizer for the New York City chapter of the International Direct Action Group, Reclaim the Streets. In 2009, he was a research associate at the i -Beam Center for Art and Technology in New York City and is presently co-founder and director of the new Center for Artistic <coughs> Activism. Duncombe is currently working on a book on the art of propaganda during the New Deal and an open access, open source, web-based edition of Thomas More's Utopia. So with those words, I want to welcome very warmly Stephen Duncombe. Thank you and uh, good morning. And on a morning about three years ago, kind of the same weather, crappy, um, uh, New Yorkers awoke to a special edition of the New York Times. Early this morning, commuters nationwide were delighted to find out that while they were sleeping, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had come to an end. According to the newspaper's publishers, 1.2 million papers were printed at six different presses. They were driven to a number of prearranged pickup locations where thousands of volunteers stood ready to pass them out on the street. Articles in the paper announced the establishment of national health care, the abolition of corporate lobbying, a maximum wage for CEOs, and of course, the end of the war. The paper includes international, national, New York, and business sections, as well as editorials, advertisements, and even a page of corrections. Uh, I don't know, it's like a dream, you know, you, you, you talk about it, everybody's talking about it, it's like, this war needs to end, and here the war is over, it's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And I knew change was coming to America, I just didn't expect it so fast. It's incredible. This could really expand our idea of what's possible. This is a, a, a deep, positive, potential thing happening here, and so I'll take the prank for that, and I think the time should do. But I don't understand what statement they're trying to make. We've been all over the uh, Bush administration since day one. We set the standard for coverage of the Iraq war. Like Judith Miller? Then we have to exercise some muscles we either don't have or that have atrophied or something, a civic muscle, a, 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 a thrifty muscle, um, a generous muscle. I can't believe that the war is over. <laughs> wow, unbelievable. Oh my God, I, I don't know what to say, I'm trembling. <laughs> <laughs> well, what if? What if? This is Ben Kitzer, reporting from New York City. <laughs> uh, full disclosure, um, all of that was orchestrated two days before it actually came out. Um, if you notice, there's a TV star as one of the actors there. Um, it was, a, it was a, just like the paper itself, it, it was a farce. Um, other full disclosure, um, they didn't distribute 1.2 million copies, but only 80,000 copies. Um, and the final disclosure is I actually worked on it itself myself. I did the advertising. Um, so, uh, but in any case, the, the special edition, um, which is what you've just seen, was a project facilitated by two artists and activists, Steve Lambert and Andy Bickelbaum of the Yes Men, with literally hundreds of contributors and participants and this edition of the Times was not a record of what was. Uh, the Times built itself as the paper of record, but instead an active imagination of what could be. As the fellow interviewed said, it's like a dream. The paper was a tangible product. As it's going around, you can see it looks like the Times, it feels like the Times. 
Um, it was actually laid out by people who actually work for the Times. Be quiet. Um, but in any case, it actually um, is a tangible product of an imaginary future. It was, as the altered motto in the upper left corner reads, all the, knows the, all the news we hope to print. As Andy Bickelbaum commented at the time, we wanted people to read this and say to themselves, what if? And what if, as Richard reminded us yesterday, is the utopian question par excellence. And crickets, there's crickets. <laughs> uh, this was an act of, uh, of sort of utopian art slash politics. Um, both Andy and Steve are trained as artists, but they also see themselves as political activists. Um, but what I want to think about today, and it raises the question for how should we think about utopian gestures? How should we think about utopian politics? Um, one way is to look at the practice of utopia in the past century that is actually existing utopias. If this is where utopian imagination leads to, then we should probably just stop the project right here, pack up, go home. Thanks for sending me Copenhagen. <laughs> um, but I actually don't think this is the inevitable outcome. And I, I actually think there is a solution to the horror of actually existing utopia. And one that's been there all along, um, that is Thomas More's utopia. In other words, what I want to argue today is that the resolution of the problem of utopia can actually be found in utopia itself. So let's do a little diversion into Thomas More's Utopia. When More sat down to write Utopia over 1515 and 1516 during a lull in a fruitless trip to um, the Netherlands, a diplomatic mission he was on, he was part of a long literary tradition and philosophical tradition of imagining alternative worlds, philosophers, travel writers, theologians, and so on. Um, but Utopia literally names the practice. One needn't have read the book, nor even know that such a book exists, to be familiar with the word. And utopia has entered the popular lexicon to represent almost any positive ideal of society. But given how commonly the term is used and how widely it is applied, utopia is an exceedingly curious book, and much less straightforward than one might think. First of all, it's two books, actually. And the second book was written before the first book. Um, and it was originally published with Letters, alphabet, maps, commendations, and marginalia, most of which gets stripped out in the editions you get today. But I, I definitely recommend you actually get an edition with all this, because it's quite revealing. And my, um, my project, the web-based project, actually has these as open source. Um, but in any case, what's, what's interesting about it is that, that book one is actually fascinating, because it's about the failure of rational criticism. Okay? It's essentially Raphael Hitlerday meeting with Thomas More and his friend Peter Giles, lays out his political ideas about things like crime and property, and nobody listens. Book two, on the other hand, is a description of the island of utopia through the words of the narrator Raphael Hitlerday, and is what we think of when we think of utopia. And that's what I really want to talk about. One is utopia is, well, utopic, okay? Particularly the last, there being no lawyers. Um, the people that populate utopia are kind and generous, and shoulder the responsibility for the general welfare as the natural order of things. They always have work, yet also enjoy a great deal of leisure, which they spend in discussion, music, or attending public lectures. Alas, there's no gambling, beer halls, and wine bars. There is ideological indoctrination, to be sure. But even this is idealized. The utopians begin each communal meal with reading on a moral topic, but, as Hitler Day is careful to tell us, they keep it brief, lest it become a bore, which I always, I think, is good advice to lecturers as well. Um, at the root of utopia, and from, what, uh, from which everything grows, is the community of property. The quality of this society is best described as, though no one owns everything, 
all are rich. In brief, utopia is everything more 16th century Europe is not. In other words, it fulfills what Richard called a diagnostic dimension. It's a critique of the society of which Moore is from. And this inversion is perhaps best illustrated by one of the few anecdotes the book contains. It regards a group of ambassadors from a far off land who come to Utopia. And thinking to impress the Utopians, they wear all of their finery, silver, gold, drape themselves with jewels. What they don't know, however, is that Utopians put a different signification on all these items. Jewels are playthings for children, and well, gold and silver is actually used for something quite else entirely. It's what they make the chamber pots in Utopia from. I couldn't find an image of a chamber pot, but I thought Damien <laughs> Hirst's uh, skull is equally absurd. Um, but as I said before, Moore's Utopia is a very curious book. It's full of contradictions, riddles, and paradoxes. The grandest one, and the one we're all familiar with, is the title itself. Utopia is a made-up word, um, as was uh, as was discussed yesterday, of um, the Greek ou and topos, which translates out as new, no place. But in addition, the storyteller who we learn about Utopia from is a fellow named Raphael Hithlidae, or Hithlidaeus in the Latin, which comes from the Greek for huthlos, which means nonsense, which is how Plato uses it quite frequently in the Republic. So here we are, at the onset, being told of a place which is named out of existence by a narrator who is named as unreliable. And so begins the entire debate. Is the entirety of Moore's utopia a satire, an exercise demonstrating the absurdity of such radical acts of imagination? Or is it actually an earnest effort to suggest and promote such imagination? And utopian scholars have been fighting about this for 500 years. Um, so I'm gonna lay out kind of the two sides on this. Um, this is the more orthodox um, interpretation, which really reigned until about the 1970s, 1980s, which is that Moore, yes, he has some silliness in there, but he's essentially, it's a sincere text. Um, and there's quite a bit of, of evidence for this. Um, Moore, as you probably know, was a devout Christian. He uh, once contemplated the priesthood and gave his life for his faith. He sincerely believed in the community of the common property of Christ's disciples. In Moore's utopia, it's been suggested, I think with some credibility, the idea of the common property is based on this model. Indeed, in utopia itself, we're told that even though the utopians hold religious freedom dear, they take to Christianity when it is explained to them because there's a resonance with their own order, the idea of a community of property. As such, it's a stretch to imagine that like a religious man like Moore, a deeply religious man like Moore, would satirize the community of Christ. There's also, if you've read the book, you know this, painstaking detail in the descriptions of what utopia looks like, starting out with a geographical description of utopia. Um, there's also this, in the letters, there's this fabulous back and forth between Thomas More and Peter Giles, in which Thomas More says to Peter Giles, well, I'm really worried, Peter, because I've now produced this book. And in the book, I remember Raphael Hithliday saying that the bridge that spans this river is 50 meters wide or 500 meters wide. Yet, someone who was also there seems to remember that he described the river as only 300 meters. There seems to be a discrepancy here. So please, if you see Raphael Hithliday, find out what the truth is so we can make some sort of correction, okay? In this interpretation, this, this veracity that Moore tries to build through these details is meant to actually create a sense of the real for the reader itself. The obvious absurdities that Utopia does contain, for example, chamber pots made of silver and gold, then can just be understood as a way to throw into sharp relief the corruptions of contemporary Christendom. In the marginalia at this point in the text, it says, oh, magnificent scorn for gold. Less charitably, such silli silliness can be seen as sort of a political cover for airing heretical political and religious views. You know, um, you can imagine him in front of an inquisitor saying, well, come on, I was just kidding, obviously. <laughs> On the other hand, there's evidence for the satirical interpretation. In addition to the names given the place and the narrator, Moore, in his description of the island of Utopia, makes attractive possibilities, things like uh, female equality, elected priesthood, religious freedom, common property, outlawing lawyers, and so on and so forth, that he, in his real life, as a lawyer, as a man, as a future king's uh, chancellor, 
would not seem to be receptive to. In other words, there's a, there's a, a tension between the world he proposes and the world he actually lives. He then places these radical political imaginaries, like female equality, elected priesthood, and government, within a society that also uses silver and gold chamber pots. As such, one might argue, he effective, effectively ridicules all possibilities. By taking the absurd and putting against the radical, it makes the radical absurd. One might imagine the argument, communal property and women priests, well, that's about as absurd as taking a crap in a gold and silver chamber pot. And asides throughout the book, and ancillary letters all suggest utopia is not to be taken seriously. Go back to my example before, the conversation in which he talks to his friend, Moore talks to his friend and says, well, listen, I'm worried about this discrepancy of the measurement of the bridge. If you see Raphael Hisler Day, find out for him, from him, how long the bridge is. Now, the obvious joke there is Raphael Hisler Day doesn't exist. There will be no fact checking because there's no one to check the facts with. And so one can see this as an elaborate sort of in-joke between Moore and his friends. And again, the letters that surround uh, 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 Utopia support this interpretation. There's also something kind of fascinating, which is this is the alphabet that was produced in the first four printings in 1516 and uh, to 1518. Um, I had a friend of mine um, who's a classic scholar come in and read it. Um, it's a made-up language. Um, the top there is a poem. This is the translation of the poem into Latin. That was the translation in Utopian. And Utopian is sort of a mishmash of Greek and, and, um, and, and Latin. And he's reading this um, and gets to the final line and starts laughing. And I'm like, why are you laughing? He said, because these words are unpronounceable. Um, that as you get towards the bottom, the, the V's turn into W's. And you actually, your mouth, it's very hard to make your mouth actually say um, the words. Now, of course, Moore's erudite audience would have understood that. They would have read it, they would have gotten to these words which are literally unpronounceable and would have started laughing, okay? Um, so here's the two sides. One is that it's a sincere idea of um, an imaginary world, and the other side is it's a satirical um, uh, sort of move to debunk the idea of radical imagination. I think, however, that this orthodox debate about whether Moore was satirical or sincere obfuscates rather than clarifies and actually misses the genius of Moore's utopia entirely. That is, it's both. Written in the tradition of serious play that Moore admired uh, in the classical authors, the story presents itself as both fact and fiction, sincere and satirical, earnest and absurd. Utopia is some place and no place, and this is its genius. Moore takes pains to convince the reader that utopia is a real place, and it's through the veracity of this description that they can start to imagine a someplace which is radically different than the world they presently inhabit. In other words, we're not just told that the world could be different and that um, 16th century European society is corrupt. Book one does this and it fails, and it fails openly. Instead, we're shown. We're brought into the world. The world becomes normalized, and our normal world becomes um, alien to us. An alternative vision is provided by Moore. And then, and this is the key, it's destabilized. It's the presentation of utopia as no place, and its narrator as nonsense, which opens up a space for the reader's imagination to wonder what their vision of an alternative someplace might be. That is, Moore imagines an alternative to a 16th century Europe that he then reveals to be a work of imagination. It is, after all, no place, but the reader's been infected. Another option has been shown. They can't safely return to the assurance of their own present as the naturalness of their own world has been disrupted. The opening lines of a brief poem attached to the first printings of Utopia reads, Will thou now what wonders strange be in the land that late was found? Will thou learn thy life to lead by diverse ways that godly be? Or as the old American World War I song said, went, how are you going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? That is, once an alternative, that is, diverse ways that godly be has been imagined, to stay where one is or try something else becomes a question that demands attention and a choice. Yet the choice that Moore offers is not an easy one. By destabilizing his own design of an ideal society, 
he keeps us from short-circuiting this imaginative moment into a fixed imaginary that is a realizable future. We can't simply swap ready-made plan A for ready-made plan B, that is, European society in the 16th century for this idealized society that Morrison created. We have to generate our own plans because B is untenable, it's unrealizable. The problem with most imaginaries is they posit themselves as a realizable possibility. Their designers imagine a future or an alternative and present it as the future or the alternative. If made manifest, this leads to a number of not mutually exclusive results. One, brutalizing the present to bring it into line with the imagined future. Nazi genocide, communist forced collectivization, or in this century, perhaps, apocalyptic terrorism of radical Islam. In other words, if one is to insist that actually existing socialism is here now, you have to change the present in order to, to match up with this imagined future. Two, disenchantment of the future never arrives, and the alternative is never realized. One can see this in the dissent and consequent depression of the new left after 1968, or in my country, the ideological collapse of neoconservatism in the US after 2008, only to be uh, reborn as something much more frightening, um, sort of a populist conservatism. Three, a vain search for a new imaginary when the promised one doesn't appear. This is how advertising works, okay? It puts forth this idea of, a, of um, this is what Jacob was talking about. It puts forth this idea of a realizable future, which of course can never be realized, which then keeps you back within the consum consumption circuit, continually looking for new realizations. Um, four, living a lie, pretending as if we live under actual existing socialism, pretending as if the American dream works, or fifth, perhaps the most depressing, rejecting possibility altogether. Dismissing with a heartfelt conservative distrust or an ironic liberal wink, utopia as a naive impossibility. But what if impossibility is incorporated into the design in the first place? This is exactly what Moore does. By positioning his imaginary someplace as a no place, he escapes the problems which typically haunt utopia. Yes, the alternatives described are sometimes absurd. Gold and silver chamber pots, a place called no place. But this conscious absurdity is what keeps utopia from being a singular and authoritative narrative that is a closed act of imagination to be either accepted or rejected. What if? As Richard pointed out yesterday, this is the utopian question. It is a question which functions both negatively and positively. It critiques and generates. The question throws us into an alternative reality. <coughs> what if there was only common property? But because we still inhabit the present, we are also forced to look back and ask, how come we have private property here and now? Utopia insists that we contrast its image to the realities of our own society, comparing one to the other, stimulating judgment and reflection. This is its critical moment, or what Jacob is saying, uh, the sort of the negative moment. But what's interesting about this critical reflection is that it's not entirely negating. That is, it's not caught in the parasitical dependence of being wed to the very system it calls into question. For its interlocutor is not only a society that one wants to tear down, but also a vision that one would like to build up. And it's this positive moment which distinguishes the what if of utopia from the same question posed by dystopias. Now I want to do a little brief diversion into dystopia. Whoops. There we go. I began this project, actually, uh, with the belief that politically, dystopias function much in the same way as utopias, because you often have artists who will swap e either in utopia and utopia and don't seem to see and understand the difference. But when thinking about it long and hard, I actually came to uh, conclude that they don't. Um, that is, they are similar in one primary way. That like utopias, dystopias are an image of an alternative world. But here their similarities end. Dystopian imaginaries, while positing a scenario set in the future, always return to the present with a purely critical impulse or a negating impulse. That is, suggesting what must be curtailed if the world is not to end up the way it is portrayed. As such, dystopia is less an imagination of what could be than a revealing of the hidden logic of what already is. As such, the political response generated by dystopia is always a conservative one. Stop the so-called progress of civilization in its course, and what? 
Where do we go from here? <coughs> we don't know because we haven't been provided with a vision of a world to hope for or even encouraged to believe that things could get better. If you imagine, as I said yesterday, it actually will probably get worse. In this way, dystopias, even as they're often products of fertile imagination, deter imagination in others. The two options presented to the audience are either to accept the dystopic future as it is represented or turn back to the present and keep this future from happening. In neither case is there a place for imagining a desirable alternative. Furthermore, the desire encouraged through dystopic spectatorship is perverse. We seem to, far to, to, to derive great satisfaction from vicariously experiencing our world destroyed by totalitarian politics, rapacious capitalism, runaway technology, or ecological disaster. Dystopic scenarios, 1984, Brave New World, Blade Runner, The Day After Tomorrow, The Matrix, 2012, have proved far more popular in our times than any comparable utopic text. Contemplating the haunting beauty of a dystopic art, like Robert Graves and Didier Maddock Jones' recent London Futures show at the Museum of London, in which the capital of England here lies serenely under seven meters of water, which is quite beautiful, isn't it? But it brings to mind the famous phrase of Walter Benjamin that our, quote, self-alienation has reached such a degree that it can experience its own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. While such dystopic visions are no doubt sincerely created to instigate collective action, I suspect what they really inspire is a sort of solitary satisfaction in hopelessness. In recent years, a new word has entered our vocabulary to describe this very effect, disasturbation. <laughs> Back to utopia. Utopia, however, works differently. It functions not as an end in itself, but as a break with what is for a departure towards something new, albeit the new is forever elusive. Utopia is like the Jewish Messiah who never arrived. But the value of the Jewish Messiah, as Benjamin pointed out, is not that he never arrived, but that his arrival is imminent. Quote, every second of time is the straight gate through which the Messiah might arrive. Similarly, utopia gives us something to imagine, anticipate, and prepare for. Utopia is not present, as that would preclude the work of popular imagination and action. It's already arrived, so what more is there to do? Nor, however, is it absent, since that would deny us the stimulus with which to imagine an alternative. That is, there is only what we've always known. More utopia as a text lies someplace in between these. It is the arrival of the Messiah. But like the Christian Messiah, it exists only for a moment. Its majesty undermined by its inevitable demise. Jesus, by the way, was unfortunate enough to be resurrected um, and stabilized and institu institutionalized by Paul and the Christian church. And at that moment, the power of Jesus as the Messiah who arrives but is going to die is undermined. Um, it essentially, his subversive powers of stimulus to new imagination is closed within a fixed imaginary which will become the Christian church. Moore's utopia, moving metaphors from one medium to another, functions as a sort of source code, providing the core of what can and must be modified by us in order to create a functioning utopian program. As a program itself, it repeatedly crashes. Utopia is not a serious plan, not a blueprint, nor, however, is it a prank. What it is is a prompt. It's a prompt for imagination on the part of the reader and spectator. It's a utilitarian design for what my friend and colleague Stephen Shakatis has been calling an imaginal machine. So much of my thinking on utopia has been influenced by one particular artist, not coincidentally one of the artists who dreamed up the special edition of the New York Times, a fellow named Steve Lambert. There he is, drinking a beer. Um, and I want to show you several of his projects because I think they make more concrete or at least visualizable some of the abstract ideas I've just been talking about. Um, the first project he worked on was um, the Emma Goldman Institute, in which this is he did when he was a student at UC Davis. You've probably seen this sort of uh, thing all over the place when they're building a new building. Um, essentially, in California, by law, you actually have to, um, uh, for a public building, you have to um, produce this. And essentially, it says this is a beautiful building that's going to be built. And of course, it's an act of fiction. Um, usually, what happens is all the other buildings are moved away. And uh, here's this glorious thing which uh, will come into existence. Um, of course, it never did come into existence. They never raised the money, okay? Well, what Steve did uh, is he built the same one, uh, the Emma Goldman Institute for Anarchist Studies. And copying the form 
created a, a mythic um, ideal of the building that he would like to bring into being. Um, Pieke had a long struggle to place it and eventually got permission to install it for three months. Um, while I was waiting to get permission, um, every time there'd be construction, uh, he would just drag the sign out and put it next to the construction. <laughs> uh, the next project is, by the way, Rob Walker and the Hypothetical Development Organization is doing a similar project in New Orleans right now, um, creating these hypothetical development projects. Um, Department of is the next another project. Um, United States Department of, uh, and what Steve would do is he would uh, take a schematic of the Pentagon, and as you can see, um, give sort of a close-up there um, in sort of coloring book format, and a close-up there of the budget. Um, he then um, asked people, this was at the armory show, an armory show um, uh, in New York City, or the Democracy in America show in 2008, and he would ask people to um, fill in what they would like this department to be. Imagine not a Department of Defense, but a department of whatever you wanted it to be. Um, the key here was, is that you got $439 billion to spend to do this, okay? <laughs> and whereas uh, you could itemize, uh, you can see on the, on the London sort of itemized uh, uh, expenditures, you got to itemize your own expenditures. And the wonderful thing was, people had a great time. They printed this up on newsprint, had a great time, you know, filling these things out. You then put them all over the wall so you could see sort of people's imaginal processes happening. And then someone would come up and say, okay, Steve, I finally figured out um, what to do here. I finally figured out... Uh, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this huge, beautiful sort of a center for peace studies. And I said, that's great. What are you going to do next year with the $439 billion? Um, and you start to realize that this is an immense amount of money spent every single year for the Defense Department. Again, you can tell people that, but to insert them within this place and kind of have viscerally feel, what am I going to do with $439 billion, has a different affect and ideally a different effect. But the project that really inspired my thinking was this. Um, Steve and a friend of his, Packard uh, Jennings, uh, were commissioned by the city of San Francisco to, uh, to create a series of street posters. And um, in order to do these street posters, they were about the future of San Francisco and the future of cities. And what they proposed is that they would talk to um, uh, uh, urban planners, architects, traffic engineers, and other experts about their designs and how to make a better city. These posters were then meant to be displayed um, and they were displayed on Market Street in San Francisco. They took all these ideas. They actually sat down and interviewed all of these experts. Um, and then they admitted they perhaps mildly exaggerated some of these ideas. And so here's a way to cross from Oakland into, uh, in across the bay into San Francisco um, by zip line. Um, <laughs> here's the Muni of Tomorrow. Um, uh, you know, travel by elephant back, loop-to-loop um, -loop roller coaster munis, and so on. Movable buildings, um, you know, why be stuck with a building that you don't like? Why not make buildings movable from the get-go, okay? Um, uh, inflatable buildings, and uh, uh, you can have, there's one option where you can have a plebiscite on uh, what sort of building you want. You can try it out for a couple of years and then move it or destroy it if you want. Uh, Candlestick Farms at that point, they were going to the, the, um, the New Jersey Giants, I mean the uh, San Francisco uh, Giants were going to move to uh, a, a suburb. And so they were stuck, what to do with Candlestick Park? Well, why not turn it into a large organic farm? Um, there is still use for football players that get to be used, uh, linebackers get to be used as plows um, for the near future. Um, and this is actually, I think, probably my favorite, which is the San Francisco Wildlife Refuge, um, uh, where you basically turn all of, you know, instead of having a park here or a park there, you've turned all of San Francisco into a wildlife refuge. Uh, and it, it's done very um, safely, okay? Because you see the, the predators get to go in a big sort of habit trail, okay? So they're not creating carnage every place. So it is responsible. Um, what's so inspiring and honest about these visions of our future offered up by Jennings and Lambert, I would argue is their transparent impossibility. They're absurd. A city could become more green with additional public parks and community gardens but transforming San Francisco into a nature preserve where office workers take their lunch break next to a mountain gorilla family, it's not gonna happen. And that's the point. Because it's not gonna happen, their fantasy fools no one. There's no duplicity, no selling the people a false bill of goods. It's a dream that people are aware is just a dream. And this is uh, one where 
they've taken the BART, the commuter train, and turned it into a multifunction, multipurpose uh, 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 commuter rail, okay? Everything from uh, uh, a dog walk to a lending library to uh, a, a gym to a Taekwondo studio. Um, standing in front of one of the posters on a street corner, oh, I'm sorry. Um, at the same time, however, these impossible dreams, these absurdities, operate in the same way I think that Moore's Utopia does, is they open up spaces to imagine new possibilities. The problems with asking professionals to think outside the box and imagine new solutions is without intervention they usually won't. Their imaginations are constrained by the tyranny of the possible. By visualizing impossibilities, Jennings and Lambert create an opening to ask what if, and this is the important part, without closing it down by seriously answering this is what. Standing in front of one of the posters on a street corner, you smile at the absurd idea of practicing Taekwondo on your train ride home. It's stupid. But you also might begin to question, why is it that public transportation is so unifunctional? And then ask yourself, why shouldn't a public transport system cater to other public desires? This could set your mind to wondering why the government is so often in the business of controlling instead of facilitating our desires. And then you might start to envision what a truly desirable state would look like. Jennings and Lambert's impossible designs, like Moore's utopia, are a means to imagine new ones. I guess utopia is no place, but because of that, it's left up to all of us to imagine it. And I think I'll end there. Well, wonderful talk. Um, any questions, comments, objections? <laughs> Preferably those. <coughs> David? <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, I love your reading of Utopia. I think it's, it's, it's really nice and subtle. Um, I worry slightly that a lot of other utopian fiction authors aren't so subtle, mm -hmm. um, particularly once the Enlightenment arrived, yeah. people like Morris, Bellamy, um, they, they wrote utopias um, and they removed the impossibility. They yeah. thought these were yeah. possible and imminent. Um, how do we read texts like that? B.F. Skinner's Walden II is another one that I find particularly okay. worrying. Um, Which one? B.F. Skinner's Walden yeah. II. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, sort of behaviorist utopia. Um, and that brings me on to my second point, which is this distinction between utopia and dystopia, because most people read Walden II as a dystopia, right. um, even though it was intended to be a positive vision. Um, and I, I wonder if perhaps you're being a little harsh on, on some dystopias, uh, uh, this concept of the critical dystopia. Yeah. Um, so Yevgeny Zamyatin's We, which I, is one of my favourite books, mm -hmm. um, and portrays a, a negative utopia, if you like, a, right. a totalitarian state, um, yeah. but has this resistance movement, which actually I find really inspiring, the Mephi, the kind of anarchistic... Um, resistance movement, and I just wonder if perhaps you're downplaying the, the potential to be yeah. radical in a in a dystopia. Sure. Um, the uh, to take both both great questions. Um, uh, I th actually think that the problem with many utopias is exactly they take themselves seriously. Um, and my favorite one to think about that is uh, the the late nineteenth century Victorian utopia. Um, uh, is it? What is the name of this? This is blind for me. This would have to be jet lag. Um, it's, new it's not New Lanark. It's the one that takes place in Boston. Looking backwards. Looking backwards, yeah. Edward Bellamy's Looking Backwards. Um, and what I'm trying to do is actually rescue utopias from themselves um, and saying that Thomas More was on to something. And it's interesting that we use this term and apply it blanketly to all these visions of the future. But Thomas More's utopia actually functioned as this sort of imaginal machine in a very productive way by forcing the reader, forcing the person that's coming into contact to do the imagination themselves, not presenting them with the imaginary play as a fait accompli. Um, I actually think that the problem is, no, that doesn't happen. Usually it is a plan. Usually it's a small elite that comes up or a creative, you know, whether it's a political vanguard or, a, or an artistic avant-garde, they come up with an idea of the future and then if they're in a position to implement, brutalize the present in order to happen. If they don't, it becomes this sort of futile idea <coughs> which I reject it or I accept it. What I think is fascinating about Moore is he puts us in a different place. And one of the things I'm interested in with Steve Lambert's work, but he's certainly not the only one, 
is that these impossible utopias, I think, actually solve the problem of that. Um, is that they actually, by consciously admitting their absurdity, serve as a function to knock you out of the present, yet not give you a land of the future to reside in. And so therefore, you actually have to do the work of imagining the future yourself. It also posits a different ideal of a utopia, the utopia which is forever undone and are forever always receding into the future. But it doesn't mean that one doesn't act upon it. One acts by actually moving forward. It's one of my favorite poems is about utopia is Eduardo Galeano's, in which he says, well, utopia is like the horizon. Um, I walk towards it, it retreats away from me. I walk five steps closer, it runs back five steps. What good then is utopia? It's good for walking. Um, and it's very much that idea that, that you have to have something which functions as a vision which one can move towards, okay? And that's why my sort of off-the-cuff uh, remarks about the Messiah works in some ways, um, is that, but it can never quite be realized. Um, and that keeps it from becoming actually existing socialism and the barbarism surrounding that. And the second was about dystopia. The dystopia that you describe actually, I think is probably a melding of dystopia and utopias. And so in that way, it's kind of interesting. Um, but dystopias are critical. They have that function. Personally, criticism doesn't change shit anymore. I mean, it, it's no, nobody believes in the world that we live in. It's that there is no alternative. There's a moment, an enlightenment moment, in which the idea of critical revelation is absolutely essential to the progressive political project. We don't live in that moment anymore. And so criticism becomes sort of, um, how do I want to say, uh, a ritual of political subjectivity with no effect. Jacob? Come on, that should have gotten some <laughs> response, please. Uh, Jacob? Well, thank you. Um, I like very much your idea of um, the productivity of the double-sidedness of yep. the utopian concepts. And, and that is, in fact, the, the genius of Thomas More. I think that's very true. However, um, you saw for objections, and maybe I will object to your definition of uh, dystopia. May maybe it's right. a sophist remark, <laughs> but um, to me it seems a little bit too um, all-inclusive when you also take in um, natural disasters and, and simply the, this um, disasterbation. I like the word very mm -hmm. much, but I'm not sure that it, it necessarily um, links to dystopian thinking. Um, I wouldn't think that any kind of natural disaster um, will turn into a dystopia. I think it will only turn into a dystopia if there's a kind of a, a perverted utopia um, in it, so that mm -hmm. um, um, Blade Runner will be a dystopia because it's a kind of um, there will it's a kind of science fiction <coughs> fantasy of of. Uh, of uh, genetic possibilities right. and, and so on, and the creation of cyborgs run amok in a certain sense. And, and But I, I wouldn't think that the day after tomorrow right. is a dystopia um, because, okay, um, new ice age, um, right. okay, is that a dystopia? And, and therefore, I would also maybe object to your idea of dystopia being simply, um, that's, a, that's the other side of your definition, that dystopia is kind of simply a, um, a, a prolonging of the present I think, okay, the present in, in, an, in this um, intensified sense of certain dreams of the mm -hmm. present um, being good ones, but then turning into um, demonic ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, a lot of stuff there. One is, is that, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that within sort of the natural disaster film, for example, um, if it's purely a natural disaster, in some ways one can't call that dystopic because part of dystopic is we created our own destruction, okay? Most of them often have the seed of our own destruction, that is global warming, environmental change, and so on and so forth. And the other part was that it's not that I'm arguing that dystopias continue the present, it's that the, the move in dystopia is always back to the present. That is, the move is either you're confronted with dystopia and the only motion can be going back to the present to stop what one was doing in order to bring this horrible future. Um, Whereas utopia does that, okay? It has that critical moment in which one has to actually critically examine the present, yet it also at the same time posits the ideal of an imaginary future. An absurd ideal, an ideal that will collapse in upon itself, yet still something that which says <coughs> there's something past 
the modulation between the sort of disaster which you're confronted with and going back to the present which we know. Um, and, I, and I feel that's, that's the problem with dystopia, is that you're kind of stuck in this place. And it's also very comfortable. I actually think that there's something there, there it is the, like I said, the desire is a perverse one. There's something very comfortable about witnessing our d destruction. It's also, I would think that what's interesting about a lot of the, the, um, the, even the natural disaster, sort of the utopian moment, which is often there is a survivor, there is resistance, it's bourgeois individual resistance. The, s the, the small group, the family, someone will find some space outside. I'm thinking of, you know, Fahrenheit 4, uh, 451, 481, oh, whatever, whatever temperature paper burns at, um, in which, you know, it's a bunch of experts who then go down by the railroad tracks and share their knowledge. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, it's not the collective project which leads to disaster. It's, and if it is, then it's the, I mean, it is the collective project which leads to disaster, and then it's the individual which is the way out of it, which I think is problematic. Okay. Rachel, you have a question? Yeah. Well, maybe following on that, um, it seems like the implicit um, content of these mm -hmm. utopias that, um, like the Yes Men, the um, projects in San Francisco, um, they're yeah. all like somehow a friction-free zone. And, um, yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. And there's an underlying sense <coughs> that, um, that there's a kind of consensus about what constitutes <laughs> the good, that the good yep. doesn't put people in conflicted relation to each other. Yep. And there's a kind of flattening of social relations yep. in those. And I feel like this is also a l problem with a lot of utopian texts, mm -hmm. that, that they're not actually concerned with, what ha with interpersonal yeah. um, interactions. And that's where actually existing utopias have like crashed yeah. and burned. So I'm just curious how that all fits. In yeah. Uh, I think it's a great question. I mean, one of, the, one of the things interesting about the New York Times that's going around, um, and I actually don't think it works very well as a demonstration. I have a big critique of that, that project. Um, I don't think it allows for surplus imagination. I think too much is contained within it. Um, but one of the things, if you read the articles, every act that happens in there happens because of social struggle, okay? So there is a friction between those in power and those that don't, but you're right. On the individual, the sort of teenagers, there's no, there's no social struggle. Um, and with the, the crazy posters, there's no social struggle at all, okay? That's the point. Mm. Is there absurd? The whole point is, if they were being presented as a vision of the future, then that's deeply problematic. And that's why I find so problematic about, say, Edward Bellamy. Um, or even Thomas More's Utopia, if you read it with a straight face. But if you understand that this is a crashing program, then it forces you into that sort of questioning, which is, but my utopia, I still want friction. That is. Don't take the content seriously. It's a prompt. Don't get, if you get hung up in the content, you're gonna try to create a frictionless society which will basically sand over all sorts of friction, okay? Actually existing socialism. But if you start to understand <coughs> utopia not as a content but as a machinery, as a mechanism, not as a product of imagination but a, a machinery for imagination, I think you get outside of that problem. At least that's my thesis. Okay, we have last first and okay yeah we'll take Richard first yeah. um, <coughs> well I I, I think I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this and I, I like the um, emphasis on humor yeah. in your reading of uh, utopia um, which I hadn't you know, thought about before I mean I suppose the standard view of the ironizing of the utopic vision is that it's partly about self-preservation yeah sure you, know, you need to need to have a way out if the Especially more. <coughs> I mean, Lord yeah. Chancellor shows yeah. up with his uh, sticks and stuff. Or to become Lord Chancellor later. Yeah, exactly. But uh, it put me in mind of Plato's Republic, which is not yeah. explicitly ironic yeah, right. and is a profound meditation on, on a very radically other vision yeah. of how we might be together or live yeah. together. And it's generated 2,500 years of debate, yeah. serious debate, yeah. which has been a huge benefit to the Western societies and traditions and so on. So, uh, and, then, and then thinking about Steve Lambert's project, this one in particular, I, I just wondered whether or not there's a danger that humor, well, as you say, preserving the uh, kind of um, distance between the utopic vision and the everyday or the, the, the way we live, the, the humor doesn't maybe let us off the hook a little bit. Uh -huh. You know, it doesn't, uh, <laughs> I mean, you say that criticism 
uh, can be a dead end, and, and that's probably true, but, but these are really funny, and I could imagine encountering them in a public space and having a very pleasant uh, ha. experience, laugh, and then move on, and yeah. you know, not. So I'm just wondering whether or not there's a danger in emphasizing humor too much and using humor as a sort of formal strategy in this kind of work. Yeah, yeah. If you do have a serious political range of questions you wish to raise. Yeah. Um, I'll start with that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the big question is, does that person standing in front of it say, aha, I'm now stimulated, I don't believe in this world, but I've been presented with this other image, now I'm gonna resonate and imagine this sort of, what should public transportation really be, or do they stand in front of it, particularly given the context of what public art is, and the humor being employed, and say, huh, that's clever, and then move on. <laughs> that, that's problematic. Well, yeah. But also it becomes satire, and satire yeah. leaves the world as it is. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I, I maybe it didn't, well, it didn't push quite hard enough, but I mean, you could see a situation in which, yeah, I mean, we have comics all the time yeah. to tell us how absurd our relations are and, and our yeah. politics are, but yeah. that doesn't change anything. Right, but I think, I think this is a different sort of satire insofar as it does present a vision of a world that we'd like to inhabit. We know we can't inhabit. It's ridiculous to inhabit. But it's not the sort of satire of a negative relationship. For example, Thomas Swift, you know, classic example, um, in which, which I think is quite effective, by the way. Um, but because it has that sort of utopian prompt, the sort of place you can go to think, why not, or what if, I think that in some ways that is the saving grace um, and keeps it from becoming just either a blank irony or a satire. Um, the Plato one, the Plato's are a very good point, because the point there is, look, this is meant to be earnest, although, you know, some Plato scholars are saying it's supposed to be ironic. I don't see it, personally. Um, but uh, so some have said it's ironic. But I think the saving grace of Plato's Republic is, is he builds the dialogue into the form itself. Um, in other words, that it does stimulate discussion, <coughs> because even though he allows his interlocutors sort of you know, not very great insights, um, he builds into the form itself a dialogue. And so when you then approach this, you approach it understanding that this is something to be questioned and something to be thought about. And so that one, that's, I think that's one of the reasons it's been so productive as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, um, uh, you know, an imaginal machine. Okay, we have one question from Lars. Yeah, thanks for a really enjoyable presentation. Um, I, I'd like to just yeah, pick up from what was just said about, about uh, humor satire, but rather than humor and satire, I would locate the, um, the issue in, 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 in gesture, the gesturality of, of Lambert's projects. And um, to me, it's, he, he works in a, yeah, in, in a North American tradition from the 60s, as then from, from you know, the, the yippies. From yeah, the diggers. You know, the diggers, all that kind of, you know, countercultural, yeah. media freaking. And uh, as, as immaculate as his projects are, and as, as, as impeccable as they're carried out, or the, 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 the New York Times spoof, et cetera, mm -hmm. they are very reminiscent of, if not identical to, uh, what the Yippies did in the late 60s when they bullshitted reality. Mm -hmm. They yeah. also ran down you know, Fifth Avenue saying, the war is over, the war is yeah. over, or they, they made a ring around the Pentagon mm -hmm. trying to elevate the Pentagon in order to exercise mm -hmm. the evil forces yeah. of the military-industrial complex, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there's basically, you know, there's an issue of repetition here because I, I see Lambert doing basically the same thing and the same kind of, same kind of gestural mm -hmm. type of persistence which, you know, taps into a certain, you know, media reality. Mm. Um, and I think it was, well, I think Black Song says that the, the, the gesture is something explosive and the gesture, the, the sort of the media freaking of the Yippies in the 60s definitely mm -hmm. was something unexpected explosive because mm -hmm. their insight or their claim that reality is bullshit was something controversial back then. Mm -hmm. Now we, we've heard it from, you know, French philosophy all, all during postmodernism mm -hmm. basically and, and also the, the Pat Buchanan's yeah. of the world and, yeah. and the, the populist conservatives, they're also <coughs> You know, they're also into media, media freaking in, right. in their own way. So, so should we look for other, you know, <laughs> other aesthetic strategies, yeah. more structural proposals, perhaps? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a packed question. I mean, a couple of things. One is, um, I think what Abby Hoffman was doing with the Yippies was actually quite inspiring. And 
to do it over and over again with more sophisticated means is fantastic. Um, so I'm not a big believer um, in that one has to always create something new. But I think your point is, is this, your point is a further one, which is, is this now been reincorporated back into the machine, okay? I think culture jamming is, okay? And if, for example, this New York Times was simply a culture jam, that is, sort of using the models and the means and the language of the mass media in order to hold up a picture to it and say, ha ha, okay, reality is crap. Your reality is crap. That'd be one thing. But there's that positive moment in it, which is the difference between throwing dollars onto the, uh, onto the New York Stock Exchange, you know, the, the classic yippee gesture, which then showed the greed of Wall Street as they shut down Wall Street and everybody scrambled for dollars, is very different than conjuring up a different world that you would like to live in, which is the diggers, for example. The diggers, you'd have to enter into a portal in the park of San Francisco in order to actually take part in any of their, their, uh, their activities. And I think that's what you know, Lambert is trying to do here, which is create, ha you know, work off the sort of the, the culture jamming model, work off of uh, using the lingua franca of spectacle and narrative and so on, which is the common lingua franca and therefore gets you recognized, literally makes you visual. Um, but I think this, the difference is, is putting the positive moment that you can actually be part of, but then also destabilizing that simultaneously. And so I think that there's a subtle stuff going on. The question is, it's all media strategy at this point, okay, essentially. Um, is there a way to actually move this into the streets? That's kind of interesting. And this is what we tried to do with Reclaim the Streets, both in London and in New York and all around the place, is try to create these sort of living, breathing demonstrations of the world that we would want to <coughs> inhabit in the street themselves. Part of the power of them was they were going to get de destroyed. They were temporary. They're temporary autonomous zones. And, but still, the idea of creating reality or prefigurative, real prefigurative politics, I think it's, it's, it's still a powerful politics, um, particularly in light of the other model, which is the protest model. One last question in the back. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know actually how to put it, but um, <laughs> I think the intellectual climate is more liberal in the, the US than, than here in Denmark. Uh, it's very okay. difficult to have a free debate yeah. uh, in public space. I myself was arrested um, uh, for nothing in 2006. Uh, actually, I wanted to move my car, not being burned. <laughs> but, uh, but I was uh, tried for, for 24 hours, not being able to call my family. I was, uh, I was uh, uh, put to jail for 24 mm -hmm. hours. Uh, having two hamburgers to eat, <laughs> sitting in cell with uh, vegetarians, uh, having the same hamburgers, um, <laughs> and uh, and and um, after 42 hours going to court, um, and thereby uh, uh, being told that well you are put to you are you are put to jail for one and a half years, if we want to if if uh, if you're right, but. No, that's not my question. <laughs> uh, the question is, is that I want to see the utopia tax as more as a utopian project. I would like to see the utopia as a realistic project. What do you mean about that? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I mean, there are lots of people creating utopian projects on the ground. A friend, John Jordan, who's just been going around England, France, and Europe, <coughs> making films of sort of actually existing small-scale utopias. And I'm incredibly sympathetic to that. I think um, if, you know, if you're creating a collective farm you know, someplace in, in southern France, one doesn't have to worry about much of this. Okay? Um, but I think we need global thinking about alternatives. And the question is, how do we do that in such a way that we don't lead back to the 20th century horrors? Not just that it will lead to the 20th century horrors, but that people will react against that sort of thinking and say, we're not going to think on a large scale. We're not going to think about radical recreations and recalibrations of reality because, see, this is where it, it left us. To me, we have to do utopian thinking. It's the only way we're going to get out of the mess we're thinking about. So my project is, how does one do utopian thinking in order to then do utopian building?
okay? Now, one critique I have with the whole thing, and I'm not gonna bore you with it, um, but how does it move out of contemplation and into action? This whole model uh, that I'm spinning out there, the idea of the critical reflection each person imagines by themselves, doesn't it just lead to a bunch of individuals just imagining? And how does that move to actually building a society? We had more time, I kind of kind of take you through what I'm trying to, you know, how I've thought about that, but I think it's probably one of the biggest critiques of what I've laid out there is how does this actually translate into building a new world? Okay, thank you. Hopefully we'll have time for, for various perspectives sure. uh, later on today. But for now, thank you, Stephen, for a wonderful talk.